Good morning. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Hudson. My name is Marilyn Orr, president of the club, and we are thrilled to have you join us today. This meeting broadcast is available on HCTV, as well as our Rotary of Hudson YouTube channel and Facebook. Our club meets weekly using this digital platform, Zoom. When we meet in person, it's at Laurel Lake Retirement Community for breakfast. We hope to get back to that soon. We meet most Wednesday mornings from 7.15 to 8.30 a.m. So come out to join us for a meeting. We would love to have you as a guest. To learn more about Rotary, our club, and the impact we are having on our local community and the world, please visit our website, rotaryhudson.org. So enjoy this meeting today and help us share the message that Rotary opens doors of opportunity. Good morning, Rotarians and guests. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Hudson. My name is Ron Strobel. I'm the Sergeant at Arms. Our invocation this morning is by Jim Ahern. Thanks, Ron. Good morning. You bow your heads, please. Lord, thank you for your presence at this morning's Rotary meeting. Thanks for, every, thanks for everyone that puts something into it and everyone that gets something out of it. We invoke your blessings on this meeting and all who grace it with their attendance. Lord, help us be gentle with ourselves and one another, not expecting more than we can, but what they can. We know there is so much good and in the not so good, and some not so good in the best of us, that it hardly behooves us or any of us to take talk about the rest of us. Be with us this day and always be strengthening our belief in the ultimate triumph of truth and right. This prayer will make it in the name of the way of faithful li or triumphal living. Amen. Thank you, Jim. And now to lead us in the pledge and the four-way test, Mike Swain. Thank you. I have to make it all the way up the stairs, huh? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the four-way test of the things we say and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And last, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And now our president, Pat Scheer. Thank you, Ron. Just a couple quick announcements. First of all, there will be a board meeting of the club immediately following today's meeting, and there will be a foundation meeting next week following the meeting. Ed Sogan has a couple thank yous. I'd like to thank our volunteers that helped out with the um, Labor Day weekend celebration, Pat Getz, and we're Sue Carter in regards to the organization of the parade, did a great job. Uh, Jane Howington and uh, Rhonda Kadish did an outstanding job organizing the three-day event. And we had our special um, Santa's helper, Kent Feaster, step in, and uh, Joe Boisel. Uh, driving Santa around on the parade. So we'd like to give those people a nice applause, please. And finally, if you know, um, 
Joe was driving a real spiffy Corvette. It was all decorated. If you see him, he hasn't returned it yet. <laughs> so our, our quote to start the day. It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it, Aristotle. We now have uh, Dave Basil, our moderator for today, start our debate. Thank you, President Patrick. Good morning, fellow Rotarians and guests. I am Dave Basil, and it is my pleasure this morning to continue with the presentation of candidates for the Hudson City Board of Education. The two candidates with us today, along with the three candidates who appeared last week, will appear on the ballot for this fall's election. They will be running to fill three seats on our Board of Education. Recognizing the trend toward early voting over the past couple of elections, we are beginning these series of rotor meetings, meetings inviting candidates one month earlier than in years past. I will briefly introduce each candidate who will then have five minutes to discuss their qualifications and share their views on issues. Following the candidates' prepared remarks, there will be an opportunity for questions from members and guests. Those present in the room should use the central microphone in the center aisle to pose the question. Those attending via Zoom will have their questions read by one of the moderators. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to a question. In order to facilitate as many questions as possible, please keep your questions short, direct, and to the point. Please avoid long preambles and statements, which reduce the opportunity to learn about the views of those seeking elected office. We will circle back for follow-up questions if time allows, and after everyone has had an opportunity to pose a question. We ask that all applause be held. Do not applaud for individual candidates or individual responses. The last question will be taken at roughly 8.20 so that we can conclude our meeting on time uh, with one hour in length. The first candidate this morning is Steve DeMauro. Steve was born and raised in Northeast Ohio and has been married to his wife, Gina, for almost 25 years. After career moves to Columbus and Philadelphia, he and Gina moved to Hudson in 2002. They are the proud parents of Maria, a sophomore at Hudson High School. Steve has served on the Hudson School Board for 14 years, having first been elected to office in November of 2007. During his tenure on the school board, he has served as vice president, a position he currently holds. His board responsibilities have included personnel, curriculum, finance, facilities, and policy-related matters. He is also involved in various community and social service causes in Northeast Ohio and is a member of St. Mary Parish here in Hudson. Professionally, Steve is a client account leader with Accenture, a global consulting and professional services firm where he works with clients in the banking and financial services sector. Previously, he spent 20 years at IBM and DXC Technology. He received his MBA from The Ohio State University, Fisher College of Business, and a BBA in Economics and International Business from Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. Please join me in giving a warm rotary welcome to Steve DeMauro. Good morning. I'm glad uh, Dave knew to add the Ohio State University to that. Um, I'd like to thank everyone from the Rotary and their guests this morning for allowing me to be here today. As Dave stated in my intro, my name is Steve DeMauro and I've served on the Hun Hudson board for 14 years. 
During that time, I've had the pleasure of serving with many worthy and caring individuals, including former members Patty Engelman and Bruce Hubach, and those currently in office, James Field, Tom Tobin, Elisa Wright, and Dave Zero. While we may not always agree, I'm grateful that each person has demonstrated the desire to serve all children in the Hudson community with integrity, trust, and civility, a trait we need now more than ever. As you all may have noticed, school board meetings have become somewhat heated as of late due to COVID-19, the debate about masking, how to keep our kids safe and in school and other politically charged topics. For nonpartisan local body, this is troubling. Regrettably, this has prompted some school board members nationally in our own region to resign or question their willingness and or desire to serve. Admittingly, the issues and events within our own school district had me going through a period of discernment on whether or not to rerun. After some thought and reflection and a lot of encouragement from my family and supporters in the community, I'm going to run again. While some elected offices come with high profiles power and fame, serving on a school board can be a thankless job, which brings me to explaining my why. Why have I chosen to serve? And why do I hope to continue in the days ahead? Uh, first and foremost, I believe in servant leadership, giving back to my community and practicing the Jesuit values that I was taught. Men and women for and with others. My service on the board has never been about an agenda or politics, but rather acting in what I believe is in the best interest of our 4,700 students within the district. A past treasurer of Hudson Schools, who's now happily retired, would often say, right is right. And I have found this to be especially true when it comes to serving on the board and making the tough decisions that impact our children, our staff, and the community at large. When I first ran for office, my daughter was one year old. And by the time the term is scheduled to end, God willing, she will be off in college somewhere. So frankly, this has never been about me, but serving Hudson to the best of my ability with a sense of grace and humility that the world requires. I think all of us would agree that Hudson City Schools are among our community's greatest assets and should not be taken for granted. Given these unprecedented times, I think having proven trusted leadership is critical. While new ideas are always welcomed and continuous improvement has become the norm across the district as evidenced by our accomplishments, it's important to note that incumbent board members bring the experience necessary to effectively guide our district forward. So this begs the question, why me? Why Steve tomorrow? Through my background in business and IT consulting, I've been proven business skills in driving innovation, strategic planning, budgeting, process redesign, and large system implementations. Every day, I facilitate discussions, listen and evaluate alternatives, and work to improve my clients' business operations. As a school board member, I offer proven leadership that you can trust. While this may sound like a good campaign slogan, my record and commitment to Hudson speaks for itself, and that I've served with integrity and trust by being open, transparent, and listening to the voice of all perspectives, whether it's regarding masking, our cultural proficiency initiative, or the 1927 middle school. I pro pro promoted a professional lead leadership environment, which is about having the best and brightest within our schools. I've extended our academic tradition of excellence I've also provided a safe, nurturing environment, which is now world-class. Just look around and you can see how we've executed our master facility plan. A new middle school, renovations across K through 12 buildings, and new athletic facilities. It's pretty impressive. And we've done all of this while demanding sound fiscal responsibility and oversight to our staff. If re-elected to the Hudson School Board, I will continue to bring these same skills and my experience to serve the best interest of our children and within our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMauro. The next candidate is Mark Justice. 
Mark is the father of three daughters attending school here in Hudson. He and his wife, Jeanette, have enjoyed being Hudson residents for 20 years. Mark is originally from Cleveland. Professionally, Mark is an automation engineer and business owner. He holds a mechanical engineering degree from Georgia Tech and has worked with automation equipment for over 25 years in a wide range of applications. His role entails a technical focus and attention to detail and requires the ability to collaborate with parties that bring very different wants and needs to the design table. He has also, uh, his role has also included developing and performing formal instruction programs for other engineers. Please join me in giving a warm rotary welcome to Mark Justice. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you today. My name is Mark Justice and I'm running for the Hudson School Board. My wife and I are proud parents of three young daughters. Most, like most of you, our life abounds with opportunities to learn, teach, and grow alongside of them. We encourage them to be lifelong learners and to aspire to better themselves and those around them. Similarly, my experience mentoring with the Hudson Middle School Science Olympiad team has allowed me to work directly with students and see their STEM talents grow. As an automation engineer, I improve designs, balance costs, and keep an open mind to accomplish customer needs. As a business owner, I must be responsive to my clients' needs and understand the importance of investment and budgets. As a technical trainer, I understand the effort it takes to be a successful teacher. My background has prepared me for the school board, but why am I here? I believe our school's primary focus should be producing our future leaders with a solid educational foundation and a yearning to aspire to excellence. I believe we accomplish this with an emphasis on academic achievement, student well being, and extracurricular activities. Inherent in this is addressing bullying, promoting child parent rights, and supporting our teachers. But over the course of several board meetings, what started as a father's concern for his daughters became the realization that we need new perspectives on the board. I've become increasingly aware of transparency issues within our schools and of a reduced respect for the parent-child relationship. For example, when a ch children come home crying because they've been told that their skin color defines them, we have a problem. When our children are told to reject their parents' beliefs on this matter, we have a bigger problem. When board members refuse to address this or diminish it in social media, we have a need for a change. When top level DEI advisor, when a top level DEI advisor comes before the board and declares that the school knows better than parents on social issues, we have a concern. When that advisor declares that anyone with an opposing view is promoting rape culture and white supremacy, we have a problem. When another DEI advisor makes false accusations about racism, upon a neighbor, we have a pattern. But when the board sees this unfold and looks the other way to leave this influence upon our children, we have a need for change. When the board ignores repeated requests from citizens to participate or even observe closed door meetings, we lack transparency. When that situation continues for over a year, we have a need for a change. And when board members accuse parents of spreading misinformation after all of this, we are compelled to change. We did not arrive at this point in the span of a single year, but our Hudson schools are resilient with fantastic teachers, students, and staff. And, when, and we will continue to improve on all fronts. We need to assure that kindness, courtesy, and respect for others is the trademark of our students. We need to make sure that all of our students have access to achieve academic excellence, and we must not overstep our bounds and intrude upon parent-child relationships. We must face these issues head on to address them, and that is what I will bring to the board. I'm asking for your vote in November to improve transparency and parent rights, to remove politics, and to assure fiscal responsibility. With parent rights, I will stand solidly for parents and children's rights as I know that a parent knows best for what, what is best for their child. Children who face bullying must expect swift and appropriate response without a media frenzy. For transparency, I have watched multiple citizens request information about school programs being developed behind closed doors 
only to be told that there was nothing to see. I will bring improved transparency to the board. We need to get politics out. We must prevent partisan bias or social experimentation from influencing our schools. Our schools are here to educate, not to encourage middle schoolers to tear down statues. Our teachers must be given the opportunity to grow with our, our children without a constant barrage of political pressure. The board should serve as a shield to protect students and teachers, not as an enabler of special privileges. For fiscal responsibility, I pledge to honor the taxpayer source of every budget dollar. We can right this ship. We can bring our community together. We can drive out the divisiveness, and we must. Hudson people care about one another. We are a kind city, and we need to bring that kindness and respect back to the forefront. Thank you again for your time and consideration today, and thank you for the opportunity to earn your vote. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. DeMauro and Mr. Justice. Uh, we'll begin. Uh, is there a question from anyone with us in the auditorium today? If so, please again use the central mic in the center aisle. Any questions from anyone coming in on? Ah, yes. Okay. There. Yeah. My um, my question is has to do with uh, the claim that there is not transparency um, or adequate transparency in the current school board, and I would like uh, Steve Morrow and um, also Mark Justice to discuss that issue. Uh, what is it? that isn't transparent enough? And um, how does the school board ensure or try to ensure that there is tr transparency in its um, decision-making process? Thank you for the question. So we've got a few examples as far as transparency. There were, you know, as far as the 1927 building, obviously there were some issues with the, uh, the, the deed and that seemed to be kind of resolved overnight at the next board meeting. There wasn't a really good explanation as to how that became resolved. Um, that's kind of more of a minor issue. Probably more of a, a bigger gross example of that would be the uh, what's called the DEI subcommittees and the DEI committees. This is a hand-picked hand group of 60 members that are working to develop and influence the curriculum of our schools going forward. It's not directly driving or, or writing the entire curriculum, but they're influencing that curriculum. And that 60-member committee, along with a seven-member task force, which has oversight, has met behind closed doors for a year at this point. And repeatedly citizens have come before the board and asked for that to be clarified, asked to have admission to those, those rooms, to those meetings. And all we get are basically short synopsises of, of what the, uh, you know, the summary of those meetings were. So we need much better transparency. We can't be creating a curriculum behind closed doors. That's wrong. We can't be influencing a curriculum behind closed doors. That's wrong. I think I'm out of time on that one. So thank you. So let me respond. I mean, in some cases, it's easy for people to make a claim about transparency. Um, as a board, I'll tell you, we do everything we can within our power to be as open and transparent as we possibly can. Let me speak and respond to some of the accusations. Um, with respect to the 1927 building, for any of you that have been paying attention, you know, we started down that path with Westlake, Reed, and Rusowski um, doing analysis with professionals. We then moved forward with various proposals uh, with Liberty Development. And as part of that process, 
we had to do a title search. When we did the title search in early June, we found that there were conflicting titles, period. That was reported and was on record to all of us as, a board, mem as board members uh, during the first meeting in June. We then had to go to Western Reserve and a recommendation was made at the following board meeting to re remove restricted covenant. Simple as that. Um, I looked at that and I said, geez, why did we not know about that sooner? We hired professionals. We had um, Westlake Reed, we had GDP, we had pre people and it was part of the process in terms of when we found out about the title search. With respect to our DEI initiative, we have heard concerns that have been raised regarding how teachers are responding and what happens in the classroom. That's not new. We have been extremely open and transparent about the program, what we're doing across the five pillars and what has been the result of that. There have not been any new curriculum implemented first and foremost. So the claims that new curriculum has been part of that are simply untrue. Questions, any other questions from uh, members with us in the auditorium today? Uh, any questions on Zoom? No? Okay, Mr. Ahern. This is a, a question based on today's world. Both of you have uh, scientific backgrounds, business backgrounds, and for years you've made objective decisions based on information that's available to you. I feel sorry for all school boards across the country. You have to deal with facts the way you see them. And there's plenty of arguments, both sides, that you can pick and pick the facts that you want to choose to pick and then use that to support your arguments. So how do you step back and take a look at all the facts to come up with a I'm not saying better, but based more on the truth that's out there in, in from sources that are proven to be as truthful as possible. So how do you weigh those two things? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, as a board member, I think it's a question of looking at as much information and looking at relevant data that comes from trusted sources. You know, it is incumbent upon me to hear and listen to all perspectives and dis discern the information that's made available to me. On the issue of masking, whether to mask or not to mask, you know, from my perspective, it's about the relevancy and the trustworthiness of the information. And I know that nowadays with respect to COVID, some people are questioning almost everything. But the reality of it is, if I have, my family has cancer, you know, I go to a specialist. If I have a heart attack, I go to a cardiologist. I do the same when it comes to my information and going to trusted, reputable sources, whether it's the CDC, the Ohio Department of Health, the Summit County Department of Health, the American Association of Pediatrics, or what have you. It's knowing what information is relevant and discerning that against various counter arguments. The same can be seen or be said across multiple topics that come before the board. 1927 building, we have heard we have listened, we have discerned, we have modified based on input from the community. You know, at the core of that issue, people wanna preserve a building that means something to this community. What the ultimate result might be, I think is about preservation in different forms, but it's looking at all sides, discerning that information and doing what as a board member, I believe is right. Um, you know, I could go on and on about the different topics and issues that we have to deal with. But I think it's about relevance. It's about the source of the information, but it's also listening and discerning and ultimately doing what we believe aligns to our mission and goals, which are, is to provide for the intellectual, physical, social, and emotional well being of all 4,700 of our students. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So how do we look at all the facts? I think Steve actually laid it out fairly well there. We've got a lot of facts coming in from a lot of different sources. And how do you filter out which, which of that data is good or, or bad or somewhere in between, right? 
So the, the, the typical answer is you need to evaluate multiple sources and multiple sources from different areas. If uh, experts are available, consult experts, but understand that those experts may also bring along their own, uh, their own points of view. If you've got employees or if you've got advisors and they're giving you good information, you know that you can trust them. That's, that's a huge benefit. When you see though that your advisors perhaps are steering you down a wrong path, that's a good time to realize that, hey, maybe we need to pump the brakes a little bit here and reevaluate how we're going about this. Maybe reevaluate how much weight we put on a particular advisor's uh, input. So you need to make that, that's a, a constantly changing, a constantly in flux uh, type of a metric as far as how you balance and weigh that information. But you know, the, the question is very, uh, very direct as far as something that we all have to deal with on a, a daily life. And even more so when you've got you know, 4,737 students that you are responsible for taking care of along with 700 or so uh, staff members. Thank you. Other questions from the floor? Yes. I am that former employee who says right is right. And I, one thing I've learned in my many years here at Hudson is that the school board always does what's right for the kids. I've worked at several other schools prior to Hudson and, and it always was not the same. I mean, here it's always what's right is right. That, but yeah, it's still keeping in mind the employees and the, the teachers and the staff. My question is, and I'm sorry for the up you know, there, is what is your opinion on cameras in the classroom while still trying to keep the privacy of the children? Thank you, excellent question. Uh, so I've been an advocate for cameras in the, in the classroom for some time. Uh, right now we've got, it provides multiple benefits. First and foremost, it provides the benefit that if a child, we currently have a rather arduous quarantine rule that we've set in place. And if a child happens to contact trace back, he now is set at home for up to two weeks waiting to go back to school. That's a lot of school, a lot of class to miss. And we don't have provisions in place to allow that child to, to zoom in as we did last year. So he's lost that, that learning uh, chance, that learning opportunity is coming in from behind. But let's take that forward and, and beyond COVID, if we can look beyond COVID and say that cameras in the classroom facing forward towards the teacher so that you cannot see the children or at best you see the backs of their heads. Set that up so that it is uh, closed circuit. Administrators have access to it. Parents could have access to it on an as needed basis and as well as the children to allow for that at home learning. I think that is a good concept. I think it's a very strong concept to help children who miss school on a sick day five years from now, they'll be able to come back you know, they, and, and not be behind in class. It also allows a student who's missed a class to keep track of what's happening, maybe go back over and review some information that he didn't quite get during the day. Uh, and finally, it gives us a chance to kind of keep an eye on what's going on in the class. If you've got bullying issues going on or you've got uh, issues of any sort, now you have concrete evidence to go back to. We don't have to rely upon the child to step forward and stick their neck out to, uh, to bring that to light. Thank you. So I'll, I'll agree with Mark um, with respect to the point of evaluating, continuing monitoring how we provide um, classroom instruction for those that might be absent due to COVID. Um, right now, fortunately, um, our case counts are down, and that's a topic that continues to be evaluated by our administration um, and team. However, when we look at that, there's various considerations that need to be taken into account. First and foremost, the student experience. Students learn differently when things are being recorded. It does impact their participation, how they may view their own self-esteem and so on, knowing that people are watching. Um, so it's something we need to take into account. It also is different from a teacher experience. How you teach is no different than your direct participation in a room with other individuals versus just being on a webcam. Think about that. The people that are participating and listening today, it's a different experience than us being able to interact in this room. Um, 
The part that I respectfully disagree is this idea of using cameras for monitoring. If you think about the technology, we typically see it where it's life-threatening police and body cameras or for surveillance. We have a professional staff that we believe is the best and brightest. And if you want to bring people into our buildings, you want to promote a, a culture of excellence. You don't do that by creating a police state. And that's something that we need to consider. So to talk about that, not just as a solution as we get through the pandemic, but as part of a longer term solution, there's a lot that needs to be looked at. Thank you. Other questions from members in the room? Any on Zoom? Uh, oh. Yes. Good morning. Uh, the nation is concerned about congressional term limits. Why? should we not be concerned about term limits on the school board? I think that's a good question. Um, and I've actually thought about term limiting myself. My wife has talked about that quite a bit as well. You know, I, I think when you, when you talk about school districts and what should be local politics, it's nonpartisan. What we do isn't about whether I'm a Republican or Democrat, it's about our community. So if I can bring experience and I hope over time wisdom to the table, I think that's worth something. If I wanna provide service and give back and I can do that well, and I can make informed decisions for Hudson, I think that's worth something. If ultimately people are concerned about what I'm providing and the actions I've taken, vote for somebody else. And that's how I can be term limited. Thank you. So, yeah, as far as term limits are concerned, that uh, you know, we've we've just recently considered that at the city council level as well, I believe. But as far as it is concerned at the school board level, yeah, I agree with Mr. Demora. This is a nonpartisan position, uh, you know, and and as that, it should be incumbent upon us to try and make sure that we make our decisions accordingly. That being said, I would have no problem signing on to a term limit of some sort, you know, whether that's eight years or 12 years, just to make sure that we do have some sort of turnover. I think four years would be obviously way too short. Eight is probably on the threshold, but if we were to look into that, I'd be open-minded to it. I think it's a conversation worth having. Um, at some point, you've, you, you, you have enough experience that you're bringing a lot to the table, but at some point you need to start bringing in that new generation to try and pass that information along, pass that experience along. You're not gonna to wanna to do this forever. Eventually you're gonna to wanna to self turn limit, right? So start bringing those new people in so that we can get that experience passed, passed along. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Mimi. I'm just curious for both of you, what you see as the biggest challenge for the Hudson schools and the school board over the next five years? So over the next five years, we've got, you know, we've got some uh, construction challenges ahead of us. You know, we've got to maintain the, you know, the plans that we have in place and make sure that those are followed through. Um, you know, we've got, you know, for the immediate one year term and hopefully no longer than that, we've got the COVID issue to deal with, whether, uh, how we're going to set our policies as far as masking is concerned, are we going to mandate, are we not going to mandate, what are we going to set up as far as that. We've got more immediate issues as well with how we're going to go forward to make sure that, uh, that the, the, that we pull politics out of the classroom. You know, whether by intent or by accident, we have politics embedded pretty well in some of our classrooms. Not all, but we have a few activist teachers out there that are taking advantage of the guidance right now that's in place from our administration. And perhaps they're stepping a little bit too far out of bounds. In fact, I'd say they're definitely stepping a little bit too far out of bounds. Um, you know, when they're 
trying to convince their children or their students to tear down statues and this sort of thing. So we've, that's been in there for a while. We need to start pulling that out. We need to find ways to pull it out cleanly. That's going to be a big challenge, a lot bigger than it may sound at the surface. And, you know, that's something that we've got to take care of. We don't want to restrict teachers from their ability to teach. We want to give them that broadness, that ability to, to get the kids' attention while they're teaching, but they've got to understand where that line is and where, how not to overstep that line. So that, like I said, I see as a pretty significant challenge. Thank you. So let me break that into the two areas from my perspective. I mean, I think there's the immediate challenges and there's those that are probably on the um, three to five year horizon. From an immediate standpoint, it's getting us through the pandemic, keeping our kids in the classroom and keeping them safe. We found out last year, and we did, we did really well as a school district. We're, we're very fortunate that we're one-to-one -one pretty much across the board in terms of being able to provide the technology. A lot of school districts were pads and paper. You can't teach virtually that way. So we're very fortunate in that regard. But it's really finding a way through this pandemic, keeping our kids in the classroom, keeping them safe. That's priority number one. And whether we have a debate about masking or not masking. Let's focus on the North Star. Let's focus on the instruction. Let's focus on the student experience. Let's focus on keeping it as normal as possible. My daughter's a sophomore this year. And last Friday, she went to her first high school football game as a high schooler. Think about that. One year later, so let's keep it normal. Let's keep it normal by making the sacrifices that we need to make in the short term to allow these kids to learn. Longer term, we have to make sure everyone is where they need to be. Some students have been impacted academically. We need to bring them back to where they need to be. From a financial perspective, we're actually in a really good position because we've managed our dollars like they were our own. Um, and I can be a very prudent person in that regard. Um, but we will eventually, you know, have financial needs. We've extended our levy for many, many years. But in three to five years, we're going to have to reevaluate um, what we need to do as far as going back to taxpayers or not. But overall, I think it's focused on the immediate needs of our students and how we keep them on track. So good. I'm Bill Libby. I've been in Hudson since uh, 1974. Uh, all six of our adult children have graduated from Hudson High School. My teacher, my wife has been a teacher, was a teacher in the district for 21 years. My deep understanding of the school district is why would you think the school board knows more than the parents or the teachers know more than the parents? This is a dualistic question, but it has something to do with my turning my children over to my district as the altar parent in their care. And it always has been, for with me, a deep, profound belief that this school district understands a great deal about how to handle our children in the, in the classroom. So let me um, try to answer that across multiple areas. You know, first, as far as does the school board know than our parent, know more than our parents, I would say, we listen, we have perspectives, but we don't necessarily know any more or less than the rest of the people within the community. What we do is we listen, we evaluate all perspectives, and then we act in the best interest of all of our students. Um, when it comes to something like curriculum, I will say that's an area that some of our teachers know far more than I ever will. They're trained as educators and they provide exceptional learning opportunities for our students, not just from an intellectual perspective, but for physical with coach and other people out there in terms of how to provide for the entire experience. It also includes 
addressing their emotional and social needs through all of the activities that we provide. When we get into the discussions as of late that have not become somewhat political, um, individual choice versus doing what is best for your brother, um, your spouse, your sister, and your neighbor. I don't know if that's necessarily about choice. It's about keeping everyone safe and in school. So, you know, that's a conversation I've had with many different parents. And it's about trying to do the right thing to keep kids in the classroom. So Mark and I might agree or disagree on some things. That's an area that I believe we have very different views because for me, it's about, I don't want to put a child at risk, but I don't want to put them at risk, not just from a, and the argument could be made that children are less susceptible to COVID. The Delta variant is another story though, because we are finding that adolescents are being much more impacted than they were just a year ago. But it's like, I don't want to impact their educational opportunity to learn. Thank you. So understanding where to draw the line between what is the, the parent's responsibility and the parent's oversight and, and where the board and the school system has the right or obligation, however you want to view it, to step in and supersede that is a challenge. Uh, we've got, you know, as Mr. Kamara brought up, you know, the masking issue is, is at the forefront right now as far as that's concerned. We've got parents that their research has shown that masks are very, have very little effect on preventing spread. You've got a group of parents that think that it has much more effect on, produce, on preventing spread. These are different opinions, different sides of it, uh, of a debate right now that's unfortunately become somewhat political just because of the way that information right now is being restricted in, in various avenues and, and how much information is out there. Back to the question from earlier, you know, so much information out there and how do you filter it? So, you know, from the perspective of how, you know, how that plays out from the masking, that's, you know, that's one good example. And that's perhaps an example where we, we have different points of view. I believe the parents should have a lot of influence over these types of decisions. They know what's best for their children. But let's take it forward to other events. When we start talking about teaching race, racist views or racism in school, that's pretty definitely stepping over into a parent's realm. If, if we can make an objective measure, then the board and the, the teachers can very easily step in and say, you know what, this is a nice, easy line that we can walk. We can understand which side of this line we need to be on. But when we start getting into subjective topics, then it becomes much more of a challenge. And if we just cut loose the board to, or the, the teachers to say, you know what, you've got a green light, go ahead. That I think is an issue. I think that both of those entities need to be very careful before stepping over the balance of the parents. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So I'm confused in regards to the position of where you are on masks and also the idea of this critical race theory. I know that's a hot button topic and has been discussed ad nauseum at some of the board meetings. If you could discuss that in a million words or less, it'd be appreciated. All right, I'm gonna have to talk fast on that one. So uh, as far as masking is concerned, uh, I'm an engineer. I look at particle sizes and early on, I was all for wearing the mask once I did enough research on my own, not research that I pulled in off of the web, et cetera. I've lost a lot of faith in what a mask can do. If a mask is perfectly worn, it can be effective. But that effectiveness, depending on what that mask is, if it's an N95 mask, okay, now you're looking at maybe 95% effectiveness at filtrating the size part out. Smaller particles, uh, I'm sorry, um, the paper masks, like what most of us are wearing with cloth masks, they're at the five to maybe 10% effectiveness level. So now you have to balance, is it really worth the child wearing that mask? When, if it's perfectly fitted, it's maybe 10% effective. That's a question of debate we need to have out loud. As far as critical race theory is concerned, we can go, that's, that's like a whole question onto itself, but uh, critical race theory in and of itself would be uh, described as the ability for a teacher to teach 
the other side of history. That's typically how friends of mine that are proponents, I have friends that are proponents of CRT, how they would describe it to you. How I would describe it to you is that that's how it looks like on paper, but typically when it's actually applied, it's stepped way beyond that because a lot of the foundational uh, uh, ties uh, go back to some pretty sketchy information. So what it allows is it allows a teacher to instead not just go into history, but to take history and use it as a way to create activism and, and, and impart activism within the class. And that's where it becomes a pretty hot button issue. A teacher can come in and teach one subject one way, but if they rephrase things or they introduce a little bit of maybe sketchy foundational history into it, they can make that child away with a very different impression on that piece of history. And we're talking about kids, in this case, kids in seventh grade, we're talking about 12 and 13 year olds that are being told history in a very different way. And this can be a challenge when you've got a teacher who's gone down that path, who's picked that activist path of critical race theory. I'm all for critical thought, but we have to be careful as to how far someone takes that. All right, I'll start with the, um, the mask. We can sit there and we can debate the efficacy of the mask. Let's focus on what really matters. It's about keeping the kids in school. It's about understanding the impact on quarantines. So if someone else's child choose not to wear a mask, they can impact other people that won't have opportunities for an in-person learning experience. Again, we can debate, are you there? Is it your choice and is it right? Or is it a public health issue and the impact that you can have on others? I support masks because it keeps kids in the classroom. If the data suggests that there is no difference and that the case rate is low enough where we can remove um, that measure, then we as a district will. But right now we are following the guidance. We talk about relevancy of information. We're looking at all of that. We intended to have masks as optional going into the school year. We did not because we saw a significant increase in case rates, ICU bed availability, and other factors. So with respect to, we talk about CRT. CRT is political propaganda. I understand and I applaud all of the parents that have come out and expressed concerns about what might be taught in the classroom because of what they're hearing out there. Within the Hudson Schools, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. And when we talk about equity, it's providing opportunities for learning, providing equal conditions for learning. So that's, we're serving our special needs population. We're serving our gifted students. It's about giving people the opportunity to learn. I'm, I actually serve on our professional development subcommittee. And our focus is discussing how we enable our teachers to be consistent, constructive, and to address some of the concerns that Mark has raised. While there might be an isolated incident, and there's gonna be incidents within any school building, it's not widespread, which is what Mr. Justice would lead you to believe. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we are at the conclusion of our opportunity for, for questions. Um, any Zoom questions? No, no, we have no Zoom questions. Okay, uh, again, please join me in thanking Mr. DeMauro and Mr. Justice for spending time with us this morning. Thank you to our candidates uh, for being here this morning. And we have our drawing for, for, for our take today. Oh, payout is $10. All right, I'm not in, so 716-523. Uh, 
<laughs> That's James Field. Come on up, James. Here's your here's your ten dollars. Okay, and we got to do the marble. Confirm that there's a confirm that there's a black one in there. Oh, you can't pull that one now. <laughs> Oh, no, no black marble today. So the payout can payout stays in the box. Take, we will take it, we will take it out. All right, as we, as we go about a very busy week, let's continue to remember to serve, serve others and our dad joke of the day. You didn't know about, the, so yes, there's a dad joke every week. Why couldn't the motorcycle stand on its own? It was too tired. <laughs> <laughs>